All right. So here's the backstory. This is Phoenix 777 in the Stargate Discord, dropping some heat, some stuff to really look into. And if you're not already in the Discord, I'll put the link in the bio. Join it because there's some fire conversation going on about securing your assets. There's a lot of talk about ledger devices. There being like a backdoor opening for a hacker or for the company, even some um, fraud or whatever to go down where they just kind of take all of our assets. So Phoenix had hit me with a DM and said, I wanted to mention something to you that you may find worth researching because very few people are talking about this. The channel Think For Yourself first mentioned, so the credit goes there, but Ledger is not open source software. That means they could have built a backdoor into the program at MIT. We all know everything coming out of MIT, like Gary Gensler is no good, where it was made and they could drain the funds of all the users and claim a rogue employee hacked it. Even if the ledger company goes bankrupt as well, it may still be worthwhile for them. FTX had a backdoor that few people knew about. I emailed Trezor. Trezor is another kind of a cold storage wallet along with Ledger. So Phoenix emailed Trezor to find out how open source they are. They are open source for the stuff they build in-house, but the chips they have to buy are not open source as they do not manufacture them at the present time. They plan on doing so in the future, and I'm not aware of any 100% open source wallet that can store XRP. If you know one, that'd be a great, great video to make. Right now, retail is running towards Ledger like a herd of buffaloes, and in my experience... Whenever retail runs towards something like those high APYs that Luna UST promised, it doesn't tend to end well. Just my two cents. And then and then on the chat here, here's a summary. So a channel on YouTube by the name of Think For Yourself pointed out that since Ledger is not open source, there could be a backdoor of sorts in the code to drain the funds like they had with FTX. So I pre presented this idea to Rob last night, and he introduced me to Alan, who is the tech person who can give an informed opinion on wallet security. Alan pointed out that the likelihood is low because you can still create a passphrase up to 100 characters or go with your seed phrase, which has not been hackable remotely once they are combined. But Rob is looking into alternative ways to store XRP besides on a cold wallet as well, and he will make a video on it as per his comment above. This Discord rocks. So if you haven't already, get in that Discord because we're, we're dropping facts. We're talking about things that nobody else is talking about in there. We got Alan. He's going to hop on in a second here. He is the cybersecurity specialist, white hat hacker, Stargate. So he's on top of it. This dude is so smart. He knows all the intricacies of this stuff, and he's going to get us well situated in case the scenario pans out. And he'll be on right now. Yo, yo. What up? Hey, what's up? There he is. There you go. I just booted into another operating system. I just set up Arch Linux on like brand new hardware. And so I still got to tweak a little bit. So my camera was being blocked, oh. which, but you know, I end up, you know, I booted into windows, the untrusted operating system. Yeah. Yo, you guys are having some fire combo in there, bro. Things are going well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The most important part of security, I think is, just having the discussion because there's only so much that you're really going to do. Yeah. And it seems like Phoenix kind of knows what he or she is talking about in a sense. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, let kind of, can you give like a summary of kind of what's going on? What's the concern, right? And what are some kind of best practices that you can do to not kind of have this scenario pan out or best position yourselves in case? That's an amazing question, Rob. So this, the concern is, I suppose, everything. And what you have to do is you have to threat model. See, th actually, the reason why my conversation with Phoenix had gone on for so long was because she had a threat model that basically includes everything. And that's extremely common when it comes to starting in the security space, because you you start to think that threats can come from a absolutely anywhere. In a way, it's kind of logical, right? Because we, as human beings, have this innate uncertainty about the unknown. Mm. But on the other hand, in order to form an effective security stratagem, you have to do this thing that's called threat model, okay. which is basically, okay. it is what it sounds like. You model what your threats are. Are you worried that, you know, let's say you live in France. Are you worried about the French government or are you worried about the French mafia? Mm. Right. That is kind of a maybe a literal example, but it gives a good idea. Some people may have a reason to 
mitigate against attacks from one as opposed to the other. But then it goes further, right? Are you worried about malware? Or are you worried about your own forgetfulness with regard yeah. to your password? Or even physical security. It seems like what Phoenix is concerned about is remote attacks and also supply chain attacks against hardware wallets. And that is something that, to be honest, ever since joining this like and being in crypto six years ago, like and learning about Ledger, and there's always been rumblings of like, oh, what if like Ledger gets hacked? You know, there's always been this kind of worry. And for me, I kind of was just like, you know what? If they did do this, like they won at that point. Like, I mean, like I'm best protecting myself to the best ability here. So like if there is a backdoor kind of, you know, ransomware into Ledger, then like they won type of thing. But you're te- you're here to tell everybody, no, you don't have to settle for that to be the case. There, There's actually more an extra step of precaution you can do to safeguard against that scenario. Yes, there is. So I have to say, I actually agree with that. If there was a cataclysmic backdoor in Ledger, it's going to harm the whole crypto space so much. Yeah. And not because the crypto itself isn't valid, but because, well, top thing I learned from you, right, is adoption. Mm-hmm. It would absolutely slaughter the ability for people to adopt. Because what you really need is for boomers to adopt crypto yeah. with their money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you can do to mitigate against this, because people are worried about what if there's some magical elf inside of their hardware wallet that's just going to send their seed. Well, the first thing you can do on the education side is look into what security researchers have done, because this pie in the sky mentality of, you know, threats can come out of absolutely anywhere. It's not true. They come out of specific places. There are particular names. And so if we're concerned about a supply chain attack, well, first, what do we know about a ledger? Just because they're closed source, that doesn't mean we know absolutely nothing about them because researchers stress test them. Mm. One such example is we'd actually take chemicals and we would try to use those chemicals to extract passwords from a ledger. So even on like the chemical engineering front, you can do local attacks on hardware. Ledger is valid. Ledger hasn't been compromised. And then of course you can brute force, but the ledger wipes the device after three incorrect attempts. Mm -hmm. Now, segueing away from education, what you can do on the secure operations side is you can set up a passphrase on your ledger. So let's say there's some backdoor that allows 24 word seeding phrase to be sent to some server, which, by the way, security researchers would find because they would test it and they would see is it being is something being sent unencrypted or is there a payload that appears to be a seeding phrase that's being sent to the ledger server? Yeah. Um, just wanted to note that. But even if there was such a backdoor, if there's we haven't found any evidence that if someone sets a passphrase attached to a pin on their ledger, that that is actually stored on the device. Mm, that's great. And how do you even get the passphrase going on your ledger? Is it something right on the device you can set up or is it like a third party yes. thing right on the device? Yes. I, I can take a look real quick to get the exact syntax, but it's basically some sort of security setting. Oh, okay. Passphrase ledger. Yeah, you go under it's uh it's some sort of advanced security setting. It gives you a warning that it's an advanced setting. And it's there's nothing advanced about the configuration, but they call it advanced because it's advanced insofar as key management is concerned, right? Because now you literally are setting a passphrase that without it, you'll lose your crypto once you move it over to the passphrase account. Yeah. So it's like kind of like a double seed phrase. So like, it's not just good enough to have your seed phrase backed up. If you do set up a a passphrase, you need that backed up as well too, because they both go hand in hand. Yes. And what's good about it is that it allows you to implement a degree of modularity in your key management strategy. And I think that the passphrase is very important for realistic adoption of crypto because let's say like, you know, you're, you're doing well, you're killing it. What if you need to go to, you know, Croatia, you're doing some crypto thing. Croatian people are being liberated through decentralized financial transactions. You need to go to Croatia, but you don't want to bring your crypto, but you also don't want to not bring your crypto. One way that you can mitigate against all sorts of attacks, if you have to travel with at least one backup of your seeding phrase is you have a passphrase that's stored by some other means. Like, for example, you never enter your seed phrase into a device, but if you create a password and you have a good password management strategy, it's like Bitwarden, you use KeyPass, you, you take encrypted backups, you could ostensibly put your 
your ledger passphrase in the password manager and not on physical paper and then travel around with a physical paper or as I like to do, a steel stamped backup. So that way you have a single point. If you lose it, you're going to know. It's not like you're going to not, you know, lose it without knowing. And so if you lose it, then you can take measures or if it's stolen, you can take measures. But at the same time, if somebody takes your 24 word seating phrase, they still can't get your, any of your crypto. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and so would you suggest that you, I, I believe like for the 24 um, words, you should write them down, but is it still safe to do the, the encrypted, like kind of bit ward in for that? Or would you say that, you know, writing something like that, or even remembering the words is even better because it's like brain storage? Sure. That is subject to debate. That is where usually security researchers will give you an answer, something to the effect of it depends on your threat model. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we're being pragmatic, the vast majority of cases, if you store it in a password manager, absolutely nothing will happen. And it's probably very secure and possibly more secure when you factor in availability, right? Because most people's biggest threat is their own key management. But if you if you have threat actors that are advanced and persistent, then probably you'd want to follow the adage to never put it electronically. But then I like the idea of the passphrase being electronic hmm. while physical storage is the 24 words. Now, of course, some people will make the passphrase and then store it physically in the same place that they store the 24 words. Personally, I wouldn't do that because it, it's a waste of effort. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. That makes sense. So like, like a hybrid model, like you're writing down your 24 seed phrase and then you're, you're storing digitally in a crypt, encrypted bit ward in your, your passphrase. And I yes. think that's the point here is like, kind of like diversifying your, your risk model, right? Like, exactly. and even with like storing your crypto, you shouldn't put all your crypto just on one ledger. Right. Like, I think another way to approach this issue is like, maybe, all right. So maybe some of these exchanges are, we can trust them a little bit, like uphold or like, like I trust uphold a lot. So like how I'm going to go about it is like, I'm going to leave like my swing trading bag of XRP, something that I don't, if, if I sold out and went into cash and then XRP went to a hundred bucks, I, I wouldn't matter to me because I have my sure. long-term holdings then spread across multiple ledger devices, Trezor device, maybe some on Zum, the Zum wallet, because that's a non-custodial sure. wallet. Some, you know what I mean? So like, I feel like the best way to go about that is just like hybrid models of physical, digital, and spreading across platforms that we already know and we can trust that way. All right, so if ledger that happens, say like Uphold has you still have your uphold or you still have it on Zum, right? So just preparing for any one of type of those scenarios, at the end of the day, you can never be a hundred percent sure that you're going to have it all locked down. It's just spreading right. it out and being comfortable with like, all right, you did the best you could and you, you know, you diversified it out. So at least at the end of the day, you have something. If this catastrophic scenario to, were to happen because, and why I believe it won't is what you said earlier, like, this it would be the biggest hamper to crypto adoption. Crypto probably wouldn't be adopted if this happened because of just the the fallout would be immense. Like an exchange going down, okay, but a crypto like some of these big institutions that hold like um, the the crypto and storage for like the big players use Ledger. So that were to go down, it would be catastrophic. So that's why I don't think that the powers that be are plotting something like that, but you can never be so sure. No, you can't be sure. But at the same time, it's, I think it goes against basic security to, to assume that the ledger device has a cataclysmic backdoor in it because it's not like, it's a cryptography algorithm that's closed source that could have a backdoor. I mean, it's a device. People take it apart. You know, they they stress test each component. Mm -hmm. The secure element chip is one of the most impressive feats of security engineering to date, right? It was it was created in MIT. So is it perfect? It's definitely not perfect. And I like that there is still some paranoia because you never want to say, oh, the ledger is good. Like, it's perfect. Don't question it. Like nothing can go wrong. Maybe something can go wrong in 500 years. 
maybe this with a current ledger, there's something you could do, right? And yeah. that's why you always want to keep up with security. But it's just to say that right now, I think that they're fine. And it's good to have this paranoia because it helps you with threat modeling, but it also can take away from you modeling the real threats. Mm -hmm. You're worried about a supply chain attack on Ledger, where a supply chain attack on Ledger software wouldn't affect you. Supply chain on their hardware even wouldn't even affect you unless somebody took your hardware. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's and, kind of and they decided you're going to be the zero day. They're, you're going to be how the whole world finds out. It's such an unrealistic scenario. It's possible, but it's like it's one of those what ifs. You know, yeah, and there's like, a lot yeah, of those plotting for like you're like preparing for external factors that you can't control, rather than what can you what can you control and how can you focus on that, rather than like something maybe that is possible, but like there's really nothing you can do if like say the supply chain like you're not there watching over right. it, stuff like that and we really only have two options for cold storage right it's trezor and ledger right yeah i mean you have other hardware wallets and i'm sure that there are some that go a little bit further in terms of software security hmm. but they can only hold Bitcoin for the most part, you know? So if you're talking about like, you know, ones that you can use to adopt cryptos and ISO coins, yeah, it's Ledger and Trezor. They're both great. Trezor is amazing. My issue with Trezor is that if you obtain a Trezor, like you can get the crypto out of it. Oh, okay. So the physical you know, with security there is a little shaky. Yeah. So doing some research in my conversation with Phoenix yesterday, and I found that Kraken's penetration testers managed to, to break a treasure and access the crypto within 15 minutes. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've always felt like ledger was the better option, but I, the, the remote hacking is a little worrisome, but setting up the passphrase with an encrypted bit warden and then separating the seed phrase with the passphrase hybrid model, physical and digital, you should be, you know, and then spreading out your assets across trusted exchange, uphold, ZOM, yeah. ledgers, maybe a, a treasure if you'd like. And that's probably, and then your physical, assessing your physical risk management and, and right. uh, threat actors like that seems like to be the best way to handle a situation like this. Yes. I like that you bring up physical security because way more likely than that the ledger is going to screw you over is that someone's going to attack you. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I don't even mean because they know you have crypto. I just mean in general, you're more likely to get in a car accident and smack your head and forget your passwords than you ever are to lose because because Ledger decided to screw over all of their clients against their own interests. Yeah, very true. Very true. That so, just, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Car accidents probably cause more crypto to get lost than, you know, novel remote execution hacks. You know, in, in terms of remote hacks. I'm not worried about remote hacks with a with a ledger or a trezor whatsoever. The whole point of the device is in addition, I mean, I should know it. I'm just not like I'm an expert on these devices, but just tying it in with how security engineering works. Because there's elements of hardware wallets that are that are basically the same as elements of other security devices. You know, you could look at a hardware device, a hardware wallet is almost like a combination of the RSA chip that you would use for time-based one-time passwords and, you know, some sort of hardware-based 2FA because it requires you to plug in. Oh, like a as well. Exactly. Yeah. So it has elements of both of those for one. In, in other words, it enforces authentication and authorization. So I'm not worried about remote hacks because even if there was a device that was backdoored physically, it still does act as a form of authentication because you do have to sign and verify transactions like on the ledger by pressing both buttons if you're not there to do that even if somebody actually has your computer hacked the one that you use ledger live on they still can't get your crypto unless you actually sign those transactions okay because that was a question that i had was like because i thought about that i was like okay if they did do that they do have to click the buttons but is there like a bug that you can put in the code to like kind of make it seem like those buttons were clicked remotely in a sense to date no no way no i mean that's the kind of thing that it might be like theoretically possible at that point also you really get into like hardware as opposed to just software but there would be nothing that would create those electrical impulses other than some sort of you know big bang type event you know some something random like the big bang 
Okay. okay. I, I would say no in the same sense. Like it'd be way easier to remote control somebody's iPhone than it would be to do that. So I don't think so because at that point, you're not dealing with code. You're dealing with an actual input output device. It'd be this, I would call that the same thing as like if you're sitting there and the G key on your keyboard is getting pressed by a ghost. So it is theoretically, it's possible in vector space that something like that happens if you want to get really technical, but it would never happen. And you'll be a billionaire way before that ever happens. Okay, good. That's good to know. <laughs> and and then also too about slamming your head against the car and like forgetting your past. That's why it's always important too that you make backups of your seed phrase. And even you can coat, you can encrypt your written seed phrase. So you could write it backwards or you could like have it like skip like write like instead of 24 words, 48 words and have it, there be like a, a riddle system there that then you can share with some, like your family, your spouse, whatever to, cause you want to make sure somebody knows that that's there. And that's kind of the benefit, the pros and the cons of having your crypto on exchange versus the ledger sometimes too, because like, if they knew you were using Binance, they could just go to Binance and say, Hey, like they deceased, like, and you could get it back. So that's why hedging yourself by just spreading it across, I feel like is the best way to go on that. Certainly when you have enough assets, that is the only reason why I don't do that is because I don't have a crazy amount of crypto, but oh yeah, once you have, if you have a lot, it's not even that it's unwise to have it all in one ledger. It's fine. It's very secure. It's just that there's no reason to. Mm -hmm. Why would you bother having it? You know, people who are rich enough in cash, they don't only have one bank account. It's it's at a certain point, even aside from security, you make it more available to you by spreading it out without even thinking about security. But then in turn, availability is one of the three core tenets of security. So you end up inadvertently increasing your security by making your assets more available to you, but then also less available to threat actors because it becomes harder to compromise somebody when they have an undisclosed amount of accounts, unexclosed amount of, you know, hardware devices Yeah, about sense. encrypting stuff. You're right. And that's why I'm so big on password managers mm -hmm. because all the stuff that you do, you have very good secure operations, but you can imagine how, many keys there are there to where if you got, you know, some, let's say you were asleep, you were in a coma, you were, you had a concussion and your, your laptops, your phones were destroyed and the place where you live had a house fire. You want to be able to back it up in that case. Now, those individual things won't happen, of course, but there are things that can threaten availability aside from that. Like if we were to stratify that to a real world scenario, perhaps your house didn't burn down. Perhaps you just can't go there for whatever reason, mm -hmm. but you need your crypto now. Perhaps you won't lose it, but maybe you need it right now or, or you, you really want it right now for whatever reason. You know, again, if you have to travel, if something happens, you, you end up really having to go on vacation. Then that's also a case where information engineering can make it so that from a seed that's stored in your head, you can incrementally access every backup that you have, but in a way that if somebody was eavesdropping, they wouldn't be able to intercept any of your data. Nice. That that's perfect because you can even come up with like a, a little uh, like saying that you say, and one tip too, is like for like the 24 words, you only need to know like the first four letters of the word mm -hmm. and it automatically puts it in. And, yeah. and that, so like, if someone wanted to go to the full 100%, they could remember it, they could have it written down the C phrase and encrypt it written, and then they could have it in a password manager, like bit worn and encrypted. So they could pull out all stops. Is it necessary? Maybe not. But if somebody really wanted to feel that reassurance, they could go do that. Yes, they can. And then it comes down to your threat model because if you're worried about forgetting it or you're worried about your family not getting it in the event that something happens to you, then you probably want to prioritize availability mm. a little bit more and have more backups, more different forms of backups. Mm. Like in, in IT, the classic three, two, one, which is three different backups, two different types. I think it's two different types of devices, something like that. And then one offsite location. Or perhaps it's uh, it's it's three backups, two different types of backups, and then one offsite location. Mm. But then inversely, if you were more worried about 
actually having your crypto swiped or you were more of a high profile target because your public addresses had a lot of traffic. And so they were, you know, on the list of automated attacks, then you'd probably want to make sure that your 24 word seeding phrase was never entered on anything except for a physical paper. Mm -hmm. And then probably you'd want a password. I really like the idea of Bitwarden because one, it's open source. Two, the way that their architecture is designed, it's designed with zero knowledge. So if I if I was in Iran in a contested environment and I needed to download passwords, there would be no way of reading my passwords unless I entered it on a computer that was already compromised. Mm. So like like for, but really when we're concerned about remote attacks, we're concerned about that remote threat. Somebody's eavesdropping, somebody is tapping, you know, wire tapping you. I love Bitwarden because anywhere in the world. It's on the cloud, but it's encrypted. It's pretty much covers all the bases. If somebody compromised their server, you're encrypted with your master password. If it's a good one, it's never going to get compromised. Mm, okay. It's it's okay. also hashed and salted too, but I don't want to waste time. It's very good. It's state-of-the-art cryptography. So then you know your master password. That's the only thing you have to remember. And then from that, you can access all your stuff. Of course, Bitwarden, you can protect behind 2FA as well which there is just go. that extra bit you can even use hardware based 2fa if you're really paranoid and then from there you would now have your passphrase to restore crypto on a new device hypothetically if you couldn't travel with one and then you're traveling with your 24 word seating phrase mm, that's a good if you point. lose one you know if your bit warden's compromised you know it, it will it will notify you every time it's logged on from a new device whether it's yours or not so i like the idea of that because one part of this isn't just about intrusion prevention, but also intrusion detection. You know, you can have a real good security system, but not know if somebody got in it. And that's a very big threat. So another part of this is intrusion detection. On the physical front, your intrusion detection strategy is you only have one backup. If you don't have it, assume someone else does. Yeah. And intrusion yeah. detection uh, electronically actually works pretty much the same way. It's just a way of monitoring integrity. Mm, yeah, that's true. Because like, if you can't detect that there's been a breach, how do you know there's a problem? And how do you know what to fix? Right? That's very true. And then also, you brought up a good point about how, because being in this for so long, when I first got my ledgers, like we're talking like, what, 2017, 18, that when I finally learned about cold storage. And I, I don't remember if I took a picture at first, right? And <laughs> So for somebody that's been in this for a while that got their ledger a long time ago and they're unsure if they ever wrote the seed phrase in their notes or took a picture of it, would you suggest it may be a good call to buy a brand new one and make sure that they know that none of it has touched the the cyber? That's a very good question. I wouldn't buy a brand new one unless they got it from a third party or unless they didn't remember if they got it from a good valid version of ledger like i've seen stories of people who get a ledger with fingerprints on them from amazon and it could be valid but it also could not be but so so they may not have to get a new ledger if let's assume that they're sure that the ledger device itself has integrity then i would say if they wanted to be safe and they're not lazy about the security just to to wipe it you know, send your crypto somewhere if you have any, wipe it, and then restore a new seed on it. I'm pretty sure that there's an option just to completely revamp the device. Based on all the research I've done on Ledger, that will completely, it's like getting a brand new Ledger if it's a good device. That is some that is some alpha advice right there, bro. Because instead of, you know, like say I have five Ledgers, I need to pay, what, five times 150 bucks at $750, right? Instead of buying mm -hmm. new ledgers, I could get like 3000 something XRP, right? So that's a good point. Exactly. And then I think I saw something in here. You guys were talking about Linux. Can you want to touch upon that? Yeah. So the tail end of Phoenix and I's conversation was about Linux. And the reason was because we were talking about all these security threats. And so one of my thoughts was, if you're this worried about remote code or or perhaps if you're really worried about your privacy, well, if you're on Windows, for example, Microsoft can keylog every single thing that you type. It's not to say that they do. And also it'd be a, it'd be an IT nightmare to actually store everyone's keystrokes. That's ridiculous. But the point is that 
they reserve the capability the same way if you think of Microsoft as like your your family, your 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 parents, mm -hmm. and they have Life 360 installed on everyone's devices, except more than just track your location. They can track your keystrokes, they can get diagnostic data about all the apps that you use. Now that's fine. Microsoft actually makes a very secure product, but we talk about privacy. It's a privacy nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so Linux is cool because it's free and open source. It runs across most of the internet, you know, so there's a very large community of people. There's a very large network of people that support Linux and have a, a financial interest in Linux, even though it's free. And then you get to benefit from a software that really it's just a direct interface between hardware and input output devices and you don't have to necessarily worry about any sort of callback to a server or corporate intermediary so the reason why i was talking about that with phoenix and i hope you're watching now phoenix this is for you is if you're so worried about these threats but you're using windows you're using closed source apps you're not using a password manager then you might get caught up in psyops that make you really afraid of something while something else that's much more obvious happens and that is the definition of a black swan is when it's obvious mm, i love it bro this is great i think we're gonna have to get a a, a separate channel like secure advanced security tips and we should do a weekly like security kind of run through and like best practices it, you know it seems like i've gotten a, a lot of messages lately like with this huge concern and people are going to continue to be concerned about this until you know xrp it's a thousand bucks and everybody's a billionaire right so mm -hmm. definitely i think we should we should coordinate that i feel like uh, and it, if people want to see that weekly uh, security advances let us know in the comments and yeah, I think that'll be some some fire shit. Absolutely. Well, in the same way that when crypto spikes, people are going to look up XRP and you're going to be the top guy on there. <laughs> when something like FTX happens, yeah, it makes people think about security because everybody has been in, in crypto. And a lot of us have ideological reasons for being in crypto. In addition to just wanting to get rich, we, we understand that they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly, bro. And I think we're very close to getting rich here. If I woke up and I saw <laughs> that my crypto is all through the roof in a way, and it would be great, I'd feel good. But I'd also be like, what else can I do for security past what I'm already doing? Because it's if you only have a few hundred dollars in crypto, it's very understandable why this stuff sounds like alien language. But if you woke up and your device had a million dollars on it, now your key is worth a million. If you had 50 million, now your key is worth 50 mil. Yeah, yeah. And, that's what's, and then you start to think like, all right, now this is real. Mm -hmm. Now I have something to lose. And I think the next video we do should be called After the Boom, How to Secure Your Assets. Secure operations it, and in business where we're not dealing with crypto, you still have that, right? Your, your holiday season or after a crazy earnings report, because now you're you're high on your bonus. You're high on if you're an exec, right? You get some crazy dividend, but then you're also getting attacked or you have the potential for it 10 times as much. So I really like that idea. All right. All right. We'll do it 100%. I know you got to get out of here, Alan. So but I think this was fire. I think this answers everybody's questions and they can shoot more questions in. They need follow-up for the, for the next video. Absolutely. I look forward to engaging with the community. And as always, Rob, it's a true pleasure speaking with you. Hell yeah, baby. Stargate to the moon. <laughs>